Welcome, Kermit Zarley. I'm so happy to have you on the show today. For those of you who don't know who he is, Kermit Zarley was a professional golfer with the PGA with dozens of top finishes and three wins and uh, also a career afterwards with the uh, what was that? Uh, what was that called? Senior uh, Senior Club? Senior Kermit? Tour. Senior Tour. Yeah. Uh, he co-founded the PGA Tour Bible Study Group, which, as I understand it, is still going. And he is a prolific Christian author and blogs regularly at patheos.com. Uh, Mr. Zarley, welcome to Restitutio. Hey, glad to be back. <laughs> so today we're talking about Christology. And, uh, of course, I interviewed you years ago i think uh, when i went back to check it was 2009 on my first podcast which was called truth matters and at the time you were concerned about people discovering your identity so you requested that i disguise your voice uh, do you remember that <laughs> i sure do uh when i can't uh publish that self-publish that book the restitution i did it uh anonymously uh with a pseudonym and that was Servetus the Evangelical. Yeah, I just checked servetustheevangelical.com and it redirects to kermitzarley.com. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about uh, why you had all that secrecy back in those days and what was driving that? It was partly a, a marketing strategy, but <clears throat> my two closest friends uh actually my son uh and dr scott mcknight uh were advising me as i got close to self-publishing that book that i not publish it with my name uh they said you're going to get too much pushback about that uh because of course it's controversial most christians are taught the doctrine of the trinity and that jesus is god whereas you have now changed and no longer believe that and that's what your book is about uh you're going to get so much criticism why don't you do it anonymously with a pseudonym and i thought about that for about six months and finally i decided okay i'll do it mm -hmm. that's what happened i did it for like two it was almost two years and i had a contest guess who i am i had a website servetus evangelical.com i was and you gave out, out little hints right a little clues about yeah, your I identity gave clues. i gave clues just about every week and nobody could guess it for like you know a year but then i started uh as i was getting close to the time that i was going to reveal who i was <clears throat> i started giving them more obvious clues and at the end you know they guessed it very good and was there a big consequence to coming out of the closet for lack of a better phrase <laughs> oh i don't know i remember uh anthony uh buzzard who was one of the early guys that would send me emails he didn't know who i was and he, who are you and, uh, <laughs> and he would keep and, and so so after i revealed who i was eventually he kind of criticized me a little bit at first just yeah. saying why why didn't you come out in the beginning um yeah. and you know i didn't really answer those questions and, and now i have answered them actually I've, I've answered them at length uh in my new book the gospel corrupted when Jesus became God. That's a hundred page book, just came out and it's easy reading. It's a primer for my big book, The Restitution. And incidentally, I uh, changed the title of that big book uh, last year. Okay. And that's uh, 15 years after it was first published in 2008. And I changed the title from the restitution of Jesus Christ to the restitution with a subtitle, uh, Biblical Proof Jesus is Not God, and I dropped the pseudonym 
uh, Servetus the Evangelical. All right, well, let's go back there. Let's go back to the time when you were researching the restitution of Jesus Christ, which um, was the 1980s, the 1990s, was that yeah. research period mainly? Because uh, th this book you finished, I think, in 2008, originally? I, I published it at the end of 2008. Right. So talk to me about that research project. Uh, why Why was this so important to you as a, as a professional golfer? You know, people would say, what's this? What's this Zarley doing here in theology anyhow? Right. And uh, t just walk us through that just ever so briefly, what that journey was like, that 15 years in particular. Yeah, there's kind of, uh, that raises another question. Uh, why did I even become a theological writer? Yeah, yeah, please get into yeah, that too. I, uh, I played on the uh, the regular PGA Tour, they call it, uh, from 1964 through 1982. So that was 18 years full time. Um, <clears throat> on the PGA Tour, uh, the first key thing that a, a player needs to do in order to be successful is they need to stay exempt, it's called. That means that you're eligible to play in all of the tournaments except in the majors, you might have to qualify for those. So <clears throat> uh, that means that you, you're an exempt player. And of course you meet certain qualifications in order to be an exempt player, stay in the top 60 money winners or win a tournament. And so I was doing that the whole time, the 18 years, except for about six months, I went non-exempt back in 70. Then I won the Canadian Open. But by the time 1982 rolled around, I was going to lose my exemption. Okay. So I had a family, three children. Uh, that would mean that I had to go to the qualifying school and try to qualify to get exempt for one more year. Well, I wasn't going to do that. Uh, I was past that in my life. And so it's time to fold up shop and go and do something else. So I had four options uh, that I was considering. Uh, Ping asked me to go to work for them. I was a very close friend with the founder and owner, uh, <clears throat> Solheim. And, uh, and so I almost did that, but I didn't. Uh, I also, uh, I had other options. One was uh, I was building golf clubs as a hobby. I had a different kind of a golf club, a hollowed out club. Uh, and I knew that this was going to take over the market, uh, hollowed out for woods. And, uh, and so I almost did that. But through much prayer, I decided, no, I'm going to go into some kind of Christian ministry. And so I had ha also had a hobby of writing a book about uh, biblical eschatology. I'd been a student of that ever since uh, my late teens. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to go into Christian publishing. And uh, this idea of who is Jesus, is he God, is God three persons, uh, I've been taught that ever since, you know, uh, the beginning of my Christian education. And so I was a Trinitarian and evangelical. I had been carrying on ministry on the tour with the PGA Tour Bible study, uh, all of this for 22 years. Uh, but then I had this enlightenment moment in 1980 in my office, in my house, uh, reading Jesus Olivet Discourse, which I knew quite well. Uh, but I came to the verse in which he said, uh, concerning the time of his return, his second coming, we call it, uh, no man knows the day or the hour, uh, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, referring to himself, but only the father. And so it hit me like never before. 
And I said to myself, with my background thinking of the hypostatic union, which if you know anything about the doctrine of the Trinity, you know that the church fathers, after they decided that Jesus was God in their first ecumenical council, all of this is Catholic. Uh, in that 325, when they said Jesus is very God of very God, made a creed called the Nicene Creed, put that in there. Then 30 years later came the second ecumen ecumenical council, 381, and they, that's where they made it official about God. God is three persons. They didn't use the, the word Trinity, but they refined the uh, Nicene Creed. And uh, then in 451, they had their fifth ecumenical council in which they decided uh, how it is that Jesus is both man and God. Well, he's got two natures. He's got a divine nature. He's got a human nature. And they called that the hypostatic union. So I've got all this teaching in my head. In 1980, when I'm reading this text, in Jesus' Olivet Discourse, and he says this about his, his own identity uh, and his second coming. And uh, so I said to myself, that, referring to the hypostatic union, that Jesus is God, he knows everything, he certainly knows who he is, he knows he's God, and he knows the time of his second coming, that makes Jesus look like a liar. He says he didn't know the time of his second coming. But yet he does. He has to because he's God. And so I said to myself, you know, I blurted it out. I'm alone in my room. I blurted it out. And I said, that makes Jesus look like a liar. Yeah. He said he doesn't know, but yet he really does. At least I thought he did. That's what I was taught. Yeah. And so I so, said, I must look into this. So it got very serious. And you could say I got obsessed about it. And I started studying it like crazy. In 1982, my last year on the tour, I'm playing in the U.S. Open at Pebble Beach. Uh, my favorite tournament, my favorite golf course. Uh, I had had a chance to win it 10 years before at that site in 1972. I was leading the last round. Jack Nicklaus won. And I lost. Uh, so I'm back playing this tournament. Saturday night, I should have been going to bed. Uh, because I got myself in a pretty good position. I could finish in the top 10. Uh, but I'm staying at a home with a theological library in my room. And I'm reading these books like crazy. I'm reading yeah. Lewis Perry Schaefer, founder of Dallas Theological Seminary. I had a connection to Dallas Theological Seminary. I'm reading Schaefer's works. I'm reading all these books. Uh, about how it is that God is three persons and Jesus is one of them. And I'm going, this isn't very convincing what they're saying. <laughs> and so I deep prayer, three o'clock in the morning, I said, Lord, I, I don't think that what I've been taught is true about this. And of course, praying all the time about it years later, studying. And uh, this did affect my decision a little bit, not much, a little bit, about why I decided to go into Christian publishing. Yeah, because the next day you you didn't do too well because you're up so late studying, right? Yeah, yeah. Shot 70, what was it, 78 or something. Yeah. Well, that's that stinks, but at the same time, a small price to pay to discover God's truth, especially when it's not commonly understood in our time. Um, yes. So I guess, I guess hearing your story, it was eschatology really that was in your mind and you were focusing on the Olivet Discourse because that's kind of a go-to place to understand what Jesus said about the end. And that's just always been a passion of yours, just studying the Bible and, and Christianity since you were fairly young. Um, and you just kind of stumbled into this Christology business I along did. the way. I did. Yeah. I wasn't considering Christology. 
I wasn't if you, considering if the you weren't raised as a Unitarian or a uh, non-Trinitarian of any sort. You were just a, a regular evangelical. Yeah, I didn't come from a Christian uh, church going home, but my parents respected Christians. They both came from church going families. Uh, my Zarley family was devout. They were strong Wesleyans. Uh, they used to be in the Nazarene church. They came from Iowa. They were farmers. Uh, they came from uh, in the Depression. They moved out west to Washington State. Uh, they eventually changed to uh, First Method, Free Methodist. Uh, and all that is Wesleyan. So I have that in my background, but you know, my family wasn't really religious, uh, but I went to Sunday school because of that. So I grew up going to Sunday school in the Nazarene church. Uh, when I went to college, I, I'd had a, uh, uh, a born again experience when I was 13 years old. My Sunday school teacher uh, led me to faith in Christ and uh, privately in prayer. And, uh, and then when I went to college down at Houston, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ had come there four years prior. They were just starting out. And they came to uh, University of Houston and Rice campuses, and they were evangelizing. And so a movement started among the athletes at the University of Houston. When I got there, uh, I got involved in it. Uh, Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, Friday night college life meetings I was going to. I got in a Bible church. Uh, and so that's where my uh, my commitment to Christ really started to take off. And uh, I was getting educated theologically. Would you say that when you were doing this research over this this period of time, that you would have preferred to find a good explanation of the hypostatic union such that you could continue believing in the Trinity? Oh, I'd have to answer yes to that. Uh, Sean. That would have just been better for you to just resolve this one difficulty and then just keep believing the, the, you know, the more popular idea, right? Oh, that's right. Because you see the thing that I had to consider uh, so much was uh, the rejection that I knew I was going to get. I mean, I knew something about church history by this time, 1982. And uh, what I was looking at was just all this rejection I was going to get from my Christian friends, mm -hmm. uh, my church. I never even told anybody at my church about it. Right. Uh, they didn't know anything. It was only yeah, you, you kept it a secret. Yeah, that makes I sense. I did. I kept it a yeah. secret. It was only my very closest Christian friends, most of whom were in Christian ministry, like professors at seminaries, president of seminaries, yeah. uh, people who were in Christian work. Uh, it was mostly those people who I went and told. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about that. I'm kind of interested to hear about how you met Ed Clowney and R.C. Sproul in particular, uh, because I, I think your friend had challenged you or maybe required you to meet with these other guys because you wanted to start the, the Bible study and he he wanted them to check you out or something like that. Could you comment on that or remind us that story? Well, the, the, the uh, PJ Tour Bible study had started my second year on the tour in 1965. Okay, so it was already there, but you, yeah. you, you must have... Uh, started to tell your your co-leader or co-founder or something, right? About yeah, your reservations. The, uh, the, the person who imparted the idea to me and Babe Hiskey, my closest friend on the PGA Tour, uh, we've been roommates in college. And so we went to the same church in Houston, Bracca Church, mm -hmm. uh, an independent Bible church. And so... <clears throat> Uh, Babe had an older brother, and when I came to the University of Houston, uh, th that was really inspiration for me uh, to go to the school, to, to stay there at the school. I actually thought about quitting uh, because I was homesick. 
Um, but it was people like Jim Hiskey, Babe's older brother, uh, who I thought to myself, these people, these guys that I'm meeting here, these are really good people. What I need to do is stay here at the University of Houston and not go home. I had these scholarship offers by other schools, Stanford, University of Washington, in the town where I live in Seattle. Uh, that would have been easier doing that than going way down to Houston. And so, but it was because of the, the, Christ, the Christian uh, life and testimony of these people uh, that I decided to stay. And one was Jim Hiskey. So Jim, uh, Bill Bright, the head of Campus Crusade for Christ, the founder, uh, Bill sent Jim to Houston, where Jim had graduated from college there and was an All-American on the golf team three years. Uh, Bill Bright sent him to Houston and Rice University campus uh, to be their person uh, on Campus Crusade for Christ. And so Jim was in his, I think it was his first year uh, with Campus Crusade for Christ at the University of Houston and Rice. And, uh, and so then after Babe and I graduated from school, and we got on the PGA Tour, Jim, who now had left campus, well, wait a minute, no, he left in 1966 or seven. In 1964, Jim imparted the idea to Babe and myself, why don't you guys start a Bible study on the PGA Tour? So that's what we did. And Jim kind of oversaw the work Eventually, he left Crusade. He went to Washington, D.C., hooked up with uh, Dick Halverson, who became the, uh, uh, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate for 15 years. He was the pastor of the Presbyterian Church that President Dwight Eisenhower had attended. Uh, and so Jim hooked up with Dick Halverson and Doug Coe, who... Uh, we're conducting this, um, it was, it came to be called the fellowship. Okay. And so at first it was inter inter uh, uh, Christian leadership. And then they changed the name. And so by that time, Jim was with the fellowship foundation. So 15, 18 years later, well, almost in 1982, the first person I went to after I made my decision when I was playing in the U.S. Open, that in mid-June, I went to Jim and I told him. Uh, now, the reason I told Jim was that he knew that I was going to be leaving the PGA Tour at the end of this year, 1982, because uh -huh. I was going to lose my exemption. And I said, I, I need to decide what I'm going to do with my life. And I, I told him I was thinking about uh, being involved in some kind of Christian ministry. And I, I thought that I wanted to try to write some theological books. And so Jim said, hey, why don't you come to uh, D.C. and join us in the fellowship? And so Jim's thinking about that and I'm thinking about it. And so I thought, well, since I've changed my theology on an important matter here, I better go tell Jim. So mm -hmm. I went and told him he was alarmed, as uh, anyone would expect. And he said, would you go talk to some people about this? I said, sure. So he selected three people. And that was Ed Clowney, who at the time was the president of Westminster Seminary. Uh, we went and played golf with Ed. Uh, he was a golfer. And then we had lunch and when we talked about it. I told Ed what I was thinking. Uh -huh. uh, then uh, Jim asked me to go see R.C. Sproul. So I, I skipped a tournament on the tour that summer. I drove my family to the, uh, he's got a place there called, what's it called? Do you remember? Ligonier. Yeah, Ligonier uh, found it something. Something. And, yeah. uh, and so we stayed in one of their places, and uh, R.C. and I spent a whole day together in his house. 
talking about this. I mean, it was about six hours. And then I talked to uh, Dr. James Houston. Uh, he was president of uh, the school up in Vancouver, BC. Um, my Regent. Yeah, Regent. Yeah. yeah. That conversation was just for about 20 minutes on the phone. But anyway, these people all got back to Jim and they said, we think he's okay theologically. Well, what? you see, I'm not very, uh, I'm not as articulate then as I am now about it. I didn't know where I was going. Oh. And so for a time there, I thought uh, what Arius said uh, made kind of sense. You know, Arius said, well, Jesus is God, but he's he's not God eternally. Okay. There was a time when the Logos son did not exist. Okay. And that has to do with the big Nicene controversy. And so with so these I said, guys, oh, that can't make sense. So you so could have said it was an Arian at first. Yeah. But then I I, I right away said, nah, you know. I decided in the beginning, how am I going to study this? Okay, I said, the most important person to try to find out about who Jesus is, whether he's God or not, is Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so I said, the way to do that is to read all of his sayings in the New Testament Gospels. So I went to my Christian bookstore and I bought a red letter New Testament. That means that all of the sayings of Jesus and the four Gospels are in red. I read only the red. <laughs> and I said, Jesus doesn't say he's God any place. I knew John 10, uh, John 10, 30. I am the father of one. I already knew that. I already knew what Trinitarian said about it. I wasn't totally convinced of that. To me, they took it out of context yeah. to say that that means that uh, uh, the Jesus God. And uh, so anyway, red letter Bible, I read the gospel, the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, they preach the gospel, it's got their messages, I read those messages, nothing about Jesus being God, Jesus is the Messiah. And sometimes uh, you read in the New Testament, and it uses Messiah and Son of God together, mm -hmm. as if uh, it's equating the two. They're, they're being used interchangeably. So, you know, most Christians think Jesus is God because he's the son of God. Right. Uh, that's, uh, that's Greek metaphysics. That's not the way Hebrews think. That's not the way the Hebrew Bible is. And so, and so anyway. Well, talk uh, about the research project and, and getting the, all the books and uh, accessing commentaries and and what you what you did next yeah that was huge that's what happened for the next uh 28 years okay <laughs> uh, when i was on the senior tour traveling all over the country i was going to theological blind libraries all the time i went to harvard i went every place yeah you know i would go there uh, like on uh, a Tuesday when I don't have to be at the tournament. Uh, and so, or, or even a Wednesday, we had three day tournaments on the P on the senior tour. That means Friday, Saturday, Sunday on Thursday, you have a pro-am. So I had to play the pro-am and the tournament, but Wednesday, uh, -uh. and so I'd get there, you know, what, fly there Tuesday night, maybe. Wednesday, I go to some library, study all day. But anyway, my point is, and I studied an awful lot in Houston. I go to the libraries in Houston, Rice Library, you know, all kinds of libraries, the Catholic Library, um, Houston Baptist University, which is now a uh, Christian university. I, I went everywhere. I use the interlibrary system like crazy, interlibrary loan system like crazy. I mean, I got hundreds and hundreds of books about the identity of Jesus through the interlibrary loan system. This was a whole lot of work. You know, the average professor that writes a theological book, 
they're at a school. They got a library right there. It's got all the theological books right there. Yeah. They send their students over, get this book, get that book. You know, it's easy for them compared to what I did. So I worked really hard at this. So obviously I was so obsessed. But you see, Sean, what's the most important thing in life? It's to know God. Yeah. Through Jesus. That's the most important thing in life. Nothing else compares to it. This is just a training ground here. This life we're in. We're preparing for eternity. And God is going to reward people when they carry out mission that he gives to them. I believe God was giving me a mission here. And so I believe that I was doing God's work. That's what I was obsessed about. I was obsessed about carrying out God's mission for me. And you probably and so, also didn't want to just go off half cocked. You wanted to have certainty because it was such a, a huge claim. Oh, that's so important what you just said. So important. That's what I was doing. I was trying to be sure, am I on the right path? And so I'm reading, you know, some people get this notion that, oh, God teaches me just through the Bible. I don't need anybody else. I don't need any Bible teachers. I don't need any theologians. I don't read to, need to read their books. All I need to do is look at the Bible for myself and God will teach me. Baloney. <laughs> That's a bunch of baloney. Why? God's spirit works in people all over the place. And so compare notes. Find out what other people are saying. Find out what the experts are saying. Who are the people that have studied this all their lives? And they got credentials, and I don't have any. And they got tools that I don't have very well. I know some Greek. I know some Hebrew. I've had one year of both of those. Uh, and But these, these people have been doing this all their lives. Yeah. So go read what they're saying. Find out what they're saying. And so that's what I was doing. And, and it seems like you read both sides too, not just the conservatives, but also the liberals to see, you know, all of the scholarly, you know, uh, literature. Absolutely. Read all, you know, find out all. You know, Paul says something about this in second, third, uh, Corinthians is that first Corinthians uh, he he says some people say they're Christ some yeah. people say they're of Peter first Corinthians some yeah. people say they're of you know Paulus J Paul says all are ours all of these people don't attach yourself just to one person like that yeah they're all ours. Learn from all of them as you can. That's what I've been doing all my life in doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. And w when people came to you and said, Kermit Zarley, you're not, you're not a professional scholar. Why should I listen to you? How would you, how would, how would you deal with that? You know, I mean, I think, you know, if somebody knew the amount of hours you spent and the amount of effort and, you know, reading a thousand books and, you know, having the training and the languages and everything else, they probably wouldn't say that. But I'm sure you've 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 had this come up. Um, what do you say to people that are just like questioning your 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 um, credential? You know, you don't have a credential. So why should I listen to you? Yeah, I have it come up all the time, all the time, Sean. In fact, people write me off right from the very beginning. They won't even listen to me. Yeah. <clears throat> because they already know. Okay, you're not a scholar. You know, you don't have a PhD. You don't even have a D-min. You don't have any uh, formal theological education, actually. Except, yeah, you've been to a seminary and took a Greek course. You know, you did this or that, but not much. It's true. 
But Sean, Jesus didn't go to theological school. They had mm -hmm. two of them in Jerusalem. The school of Shammai and the school of, uh, what is it? Uh, Hello? I can't, yeah. yeah. And uh, who did he choose for his 12 apostles? He didn't choose anyone that had a theological education. Sure, all Jews have got some education theologically back then. But he, he chose fishermen, he chose a tax collector, so on. Now, I'm not slamming higher education by saying that. I don't mean that whatsoever. I'm all for higher education because I had to come make a decision for myself in 1983 after I no longer have my exemption on the tour. I'm done with the PGA Tour. And I went through a period of nine years there where I didn't play very much professionally golf. Uh, but I had to decide, okay, what should I do if I want to be in Christian ministry? Should I go to seminary and get a seminary education? I went to Dallas Seminary and I asked them about it. And I didn't tell them about, you know, this. I told them about the rapture because that was so big to them. You right. know, they believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. Well, I did too. And then I looked at it. I uh, actually, in 1970, I believed it for 12 years. And I went to the seminary and studied one solid week right there in the library, Mosher Library. I put B.W. Newton's books. He, they had his works and they had John Nelson Darby's works. Those were the two early teachers of the Plymouth Brethren. And Darby came up with this belief that Jesus' second coming is in two parts and separated by a seven-year tribulation on earth. And the first part we call the rapture. The second part we call the second advent. That was John North Nelson Darby's teaching. B.W. Newton disagreed with it. They had a big fallout. And then they excommunicated Newton from the Plymouth Brethren. But anyway, so I read that I'm reading their books right here with the Bible in the middle for one week. And I said, Newton's right. Darby's dead wrong. There isn't any two parts of the second coming of Christ separated by seven years. There's only one second coming. That is the rapture. And so I changed on that. So when I, in 1983, went and talked to Don Campbell, the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and I asked him, what about me coming here to seminary? And I said, I'm no longer a pre-tribber, I'm a post-tribber. And he said, well, no, you would have to uh, be very sincere to us and say, you're very, very open to returning to the pre-trib tribulation mm -hmm. ra wow. rapture teaching. And I said, Don, there's no way I can do that. <laughs> I already was that. Been and there, done that, got the t-shirt. You cannot, you cannot enroll in our school. Yeah. And so I, you know, so what I'm saying here is I considered going to seminary. Yeah. But um, you know, I'm getting kind of old now for that. I'm 42 years old. And I got a family. They're, you know, they're teen getting to teenagers and everything. Uh, and so that it didn't look very good to me to do that in the first place. Then the other thing is, what about my income? Uh, and so I, I just had to decide, no, I can't go and do that. I would like to. I would like to actually get a PhD. So when I got on the senior tour and I'm making some money and I, I get this friend, Dr. Scott McKnight up in Chicago. He was at TED's. Uh, for you know, that's where he graduated and he got his PhD in England under Jimmy Dunn. Uh, Scott became my friend my first year on the tour, close friend. Uh, I won't go into detail about it, but at any rate, eventually Scott trying, he's just hammering away with me saying, he calls me Czar Man. He says, Czar Man, you've got to go over to England and get a PhD. Uh huh. 
And I go, Scott, I'm in my 50s. I'm too old for that. No, you got to do it. He went on for years like that. And so, you know, I came close to doing all that. I believe I could have done it. He believed it. Other people did. I graduated with some honors in my school at the University of Houston. I had the intellectual capability of going and, and doing that and getting a PhD. I think my writing showed that. And so I, I just didn't do it. But to answer that question, and I'm sorry to take this this long of a time, uh, I just had to say to people, well, all I can say is just consider what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, and, in the end, the someone's case comes down to their reasons, not their education. You can have a lot of degrees and have no solid reasons behind what you believe or you're advocating and it doesn't make it more true because you have degrees. <laughs> I, I think getting degrees helps disabuse you of the notion that only degreed people have value, uh, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, why, why, let me ask you a kind of off the wall question here. Why, why do you think there is so much blind acceptance of the uh, the doctrine of the Trinity e in evangelicalism. I mean, I, I get why, like the Catholics and the the Greek Church, why they believe in the Trinity, and that's kind of their their history, right? But why among evangelicals? I mean, I just saw yesterday that uh, they're petitioning the Southern Baptist Convention to add the Nicene Creed to their official uh, their official statement in their the meeting this June. Um, <clears throat> later this month, what is, what is this with evangelicals and the, all this like blind faith in the the Nicene Creed and and the doctrine of the Trinity? Where do you think it comes from? Boy, it's a tough question to try to explore. Um, you know, I've had some some evangelicals leaders, you know, pastors, etc., uh, respond to me in the very beginning by saying, "Hey." We've already been through that Unitarianism fell apart. Uh, just look at them. They didn't even believe in an atonement of Christ. That's the most important thing. I agree with them about that. The most important thing about Christianity is Jesus dying for your sins on the cross. Yeah. That's the most important thing to believe. Most of those Unitarians way back there, they didn't believe that. And the Rakovian uh, Catechism was published in what, 1604? They asked Socinus to finish it, which he did. As I understand it, he did believe in an atonement of Christ, but most Unitarians didn't. And so they didn't put it in there. That's really huge. And so for me, what's most important? The most important thing to believe to be a Christian is to believe that Jesus died for your sins, that God raised him from the dead. And then I would say concerning Jesus' identity, that most important is that he's the Messiah of Israel. And son of God means pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, Jesus is my Lord and my savior. That's what's most important. He's my savior. Lord, what do I mean by that? He's my master. He gave me this teaching. He says, you know, follow Christ, follow me. So learn his teachings, try to live according to his teachings. And so it's not just believing that Jesus died for your sin, but you must make Jesus Lord of your life to some extent, or you're not a Christian. I don't accept these people saying, oh, I believe in Jesus. And then they go off and live like the devil. I don't think I, they're not Christian to me. Right. And so it's, it's mostly two things, lordship and saviorhood. And, and so that wasn't there in Unitarianism. And so I agree with their opposition, evangelicals making that statement. But uh, I said, well, there's changes going on. People I know who call themselves Unitarian they often attach the word biblical or they're monotheistic Christians, something like that. And they 
uh, they certainly do believe Jesus died for their sins. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, but there's an awful lot more to say about it. Um, it. It's amazing how people can get something in their mind and they're so protective of it and they're not willing to be open and listen to what somebody else has to say. You know, Nicodemus said something about this. Uh, you know, he was the man who we read about in John 3. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. Jesus called him the teacher of Israel. And he came to Jesus by night so that his colleagues wouldn't know, uh, apparently. And Jesus said to him right away, you need to be born again. What? He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He's a Jew. Jews believe I'm in the kingdom because I'm a Jew. No, Jesus said that won't do it. You got to have a change of your heart. And so it's this being born again uh, that was an amazing thing for Nicodemus. Well, apparently it had an impact because there comes a time Nicodemus uh, is at the temple uh, this was a feast, and the uh, Jewish leader, religious leaders, uh, they're trying to uh, get, get Jesus on uh, teaching against Torah so that they can uh, maybe get him killed for blasphemy. And so there's all this talk. Who is this Jesus? And, and so uh, he says to his colleagues, does not our law... Uh, require that we hear a person out. That's what I'm saying about myself. Yeah. You know, they needed to hear what Jesus was saying, not just get a, a, a an idea about him that he's an apostate and that's it and don't listen to him and try to kill him. And so, you know, I'm just saying, give me a hearing. Same thing Nicodemus was saying about Jesus. Yeah, yeah. It it does seem strange to me because Baptists, in, in particular Southern Baptists and most evangelicals, you know, they really think of themselves as Bible people. Yeah. And I think that's a very good thing. Uh, I tend to identify more as a restorationist than as an evangelical uh, for other reasons. But, you know, I, I agree with this idea of uh, finding our beliefs in Scripture rather than in the Westminster Confession or something Luther said or Calvin or whoever. Um, and I just I just do not see how an honest-hearted person can find the doctrine of the Trinity in the Bible. I mean, it, I, I know how they do it, you know, take a half a verse here and a third of a verse there and throw it all in the blender and then you know, out pops the Trinity. But, you know, I, I think I think there's probably a lot of people uh, who are like you, but just didn't didn't have the courage to take all this next steps that you kept taking until you, now you're Kermit Zarley, who writes a book, Gospel Corrupted, where you take the gloves off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, <laughs> other people are still in that Nicodemus phase of, you know, just sort of like, well, I'm just not going to think about it too much. I don't want to rock the boat. Uh, at least that's that. That'd be my guess. Because uh, that, you just don't really so, see it there explained in the Bible, right? So right on, so right on, Sean. What you're saying right there. Uh, the doctrine of Trinity. No, you know, there's eight scriptures that mention God, the Son, or Jesus and the Spirit. But that's not evidence that all three of those are gods and that God is three persons. That, that does, doesn't say that at all. And so, no, there's not evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity at all in the Bible. Uh, and I really think you're right on there when you say, I came to this place in my life. And there's probably lots of Christians that this has happened to to some degree, uh, where they started to question a little bit. Uh, but what happened to me was I just got serious about it. 
and it, it it also came at a certain time in my life. That may have had something to do with it, because I'm at a crosswords of my life. What am I going to do with myself as far as making a living? Uh, and so uh, I just got serious about it, you know, and I kept hanging on the scriptures of Jesus, like, ask, and it shall be given to you. Knock, and the door shall be open. Seek, and you shall find. And so I kept claiming that all the time in prayer, asking God to show me what is true. Is, are, is Jesus God? Is God three persons? You know, I'm praying constantly year after year about this. And so I just got serious about it. That's all I can say. Yeah. Well, you also have some other advantage, which is your your income wasn't derived from your Christian conclusions yeah. on, on this or that question, because you were uh, you were a golfer, not a pastor. Uh, and that might have afforded you a little bit of extra freedom as well. That is really important. And of course, I say that and and tell about it in the gospel corrupted. I tell my story in that first chapter. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, I, I wonder over the years, uh, now that it's been so long since 2008, uh, the time of this recording is 2024. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a while, right? Um, what has the reception been with the original restitution of Jesus Christ? And then you have the paperback version, which is uh, the, just the restitution. And now you have this more recent book. Have you made converts? Uh, have you lost friends? Could you talk about that a little? Yes. <clears throat> I lost half or more of my closest Christian friends. Hmm. Uh, I did not come out. I was not telling people much about this. Only, as I said, only my closest Christian friends. And it wouldn't have been more than probably 20. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, you know, I knew this was going to happen. I knew what I was getting into. And so I have a lot of rejection. It's been difficult going to church. Where is a church that believes like this? There aren't many of them. And so Christian fellowship, it's been tough. Uh, but hey, God chose prophets. Mm -hmm. He didn't make life easy for them all the time. No. <laughs> and so let's get real. Jesus says, follow me. What happened to him? He went to the cross. So, you know, the New Testament tells us there'll be suffering. Doesn't usually say something about your own. I believe Trinitarians are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, they believe Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. Yeah. That's enough for me. I don't care if you believe God is three persons or if Jesus is God. You're still my brother and sister in Christ. I extend the right hand of fellowship to you. But if you're going to tell me that I'm not a Christian, that's going to make it tough. I want fellowship with you in Christ. But if you're going to do that, yeah, there's no fellowship in Christ when you do that. And so, <clears throat> so anyway, that's where I am. Uh, I've had the, this uh, rejection that's true. Uh, but I, I carry on, yeah. uh, the, uh, how successful have I been with this? Uh, have I convinced people? Um, uh, yeah, some are, uh, not as much in person, uh, but, um, on the internet with my blog, uh, Kermit Zarley blog at Pathios. Uh, my website, KermitZarley.com, all my books are there. Tell all about them. All my books, I have 10, uh, 10 published books are all on, well, nine of them are on uh, Amazon.com. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and uh, 
I'm a member of the Society of Biblical Literature. I have been since 1999. I've gone to all their annual meetings, except I've missed one. Nowadays, when I go, professors are coming up to me and saying, oh. hey, I believe like you do. I read your blog sometimes. I do this, I do that. I read that book, I did this. Uh, keep on, they encourage me. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I don't feel at liberty to give out their names, uh, because they're still at schools that are Trinitarian. Yeah. You don't want to get them uh, fired. That's not the loving thing. That's to exactly do. right. So, so, you know, I'm having some influence. It, it, it may not be very much, but you know, no matter what happens, I'm going to keep on. Yeah. Well, what what advice would you give to others who are spreading this truth today? I just say the most important thing is to look at what Jesus says. Read the New Testament. Let it speak to you. Uh, yes, you've got to compare it to what you've got in your head um, about, you know, what theology you have. Um but pray to God about it. Ask him to show you the truth. Uh, don't be belligerent about going around uh, proclaiming that Jesus is not God and God is not a trinity. Uh, if you can, share it. Mm -hmm. But if people are going to be so, so antagonistic to you, uh, my view of that is move on. You can only go so far and just move on. Okay. Um, what, what's one tendency you see within Unitarian Christianity today that bothers you that if you could snap your fingers and change, you would? Um... Okay. That's it's an on-the-spot question, so take your that's, time. That's a good question. <laughs> Sean, I don't know as much about biblical Unitarianism as you do, um, but I know some, and I have friends, and you're a friend, and, you know, I have friends in the movement who are leaders. I mean, uh, I consider Anthony Buzzard to be a dear friend, even though we haven't been together face-to-face uh, -face that much. I've been to two of his conferences. Uh, Anthony, I uh, dialogue. So many hundreds of emails on the internet. I mean, it might be in the thousands. Uh, <clears throat> you know, if, if biblical Unitarians say that Trinitarians, are not saved because they're worship, they're worshiping idols or whatever they say, you know. Why a hero is Sir Isaac Newton? He believed like I do, but at the same time, he said Trinitarians are idol worshipers. No, Isaac, <laughs> I disagree with you about that. They believe Jesus died for their sins on the cross. They believe God raised him from the dead. He's their Lord. They yeah. try to live by the teachings of Jesus. No, we're all in Christ. Uh, but, so you don't like the sectarian mindset that says... That's right. Unitarian Christians are the only ones that are saved, or we're the only faithful remnant. You, you like the idea of saying, well, look, nobody said believing that the Father is the only true God was gospel. You know, like almost like your your book, uh, Gospel Corrupted. You're you're taking the church fathers to task, and you're saying, you guys have corrupted the gospel to add to it this Trinity idea. Yeah. Um. And Unitarian Christians maybe are adding to the gospel this non-Trinity idea. It's almost uh, the the same thing, but in the opposite direction. Yeah, I just think that uh, biblical Unitarians. 
I don't know how many of them it is, but it it must be some uh, are saying the same are doing the same thing that Trinitarians are doing. The well, Trinitarians I think some are and some aren't. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, there are some that do. And but I think most of them don't. But, you know, the movement better than I do. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying that, you know, if I have a criticism of biblical Unitarianism, it is that there are some people in it that say Trinitarians are not saved. And I disagree totally with that. I was saved. I was a Trinitarian 22 years. I was not a non-Christian. And so uh, I, that would be my only criticism. But overall, I, I think very positively about the biblical Unitarian movement. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself to be a part of it. I don't call myself a Unitarian, but I accept people calling me that. Mm -hmm. The only reason I don't call myself a Unitarian is because I criticize Trinitarians for calling themselves a Trinitarian. And my first argument about it is, there is no tr word Trinity in the Bible. There is no word Trinitarian in the Bible. There is the word Christian in the Bible. And those early disciples of Jesus eventually were accepting a people calling them Christians. They did not object to that. That's what I call myself. I call myself a one God Christian. And I do okay. that for a reason. <laughs> I, I'm that bringing home a point to them. God is one. Very good. Very good. Um, so anything else you'd like to add uh, just as we're wrapping up here? Maybe, um, maybe I, we should talk about the new book a little bit. Uh, Gospel okay. Corrupted. And uh, who's who's that book for? Okay, that book's for anybody. Uh, it's easy reading. Uh, there's there's not much in the way of uh, there's some interaction with theologians, but and some footnotes. But it's a it's a primer for the restitution. Um, the restitution is uh, it gets heavy. It gets deep. You know, I get right down to it. Five hundred seventy pages. And you know, you have the book. Uh, I interact with scholars all the time in that book, both sides. That's a scholarly and, approach to the, the whole subject. Yeah, and that's for people who they want to know, hey, what does this verse mean? It says here in the beginning of the Gospel of John, and the, and the word was God. And then over here in verse 14, it says, and the word took flesh. Well, that's Jesus. So back in verse 1, the word is uh, God, that must mean Jesus is God. Or what about Thomas? Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And so what about these verses? Yeah. Uh, you're saying Jesus is not God, but these verses seem to say he is. Well, see, I get in the nitty gritty on that. I got 20 pages on, you know, both of those. Or Ephesians, uh, Philippians 2, 6 and 7. Yeah. And so... The, for people who want to really get into it, Bible study, that's the book for them. Mm -hmm. uh, I might uh, mention, uh, Sean, uh, because of what's going on in the world right now, I've got, I said I had 10 books over on uh, Amazon.com. Two books are uh, relate to things that are happening right now. I have a Trump book. Uh, and so that's controversial. Uh, the title of that book is Bible Predicts Trump Fall. I started saying this at the very beginning of Donald Trump's presidency. In fact, his campaign for the presidency in 2015. And I, I was citing Bible verses showing what's going to happen. And it's been happening. But uh, Palestine is coming is very relevant to what's going on now with the war in Gaza and the student uh, protests on the campuses. And so people might be interested to know what my book says, Palestine is coming. I'm saying there's gonna be a Palestinian state. It's not gonna be in the West Bank. It's gonna be in the coastal plain, pretty much right where the land in of the Philistines. Yeah. 
So those two books, people could be interested in those. Now, but, I, I did notice, too, that you have this uh, subtitle or something like that that says still here. Is that <laughs> <laughs> talk about that? Is that like the opposite of left behind? Is that it is? I, I thought uh, I thought it might be. <laughs> yeah. Here's what happened. Scott McKnight and I were rooming together at SBL uh, and we're uh in fact, that's when we were rooming with Jimmy Dunn, too. Oh, wow. Uh, and so uh, just Scott and I were in the room at this particular moment. And we're talking about left behind. The scholars used to get kind of jealous of Tim LaHaye and of left behind the success, you know, millions and millions of books. And they would trash left behind. But they, <laughs> they didn't believe in pre-trib anyway. Right. And so, you know, Scott was like this. Uh, and so we we're joking. And Scott, he says, Zarman, I know what we need to do. We need to write a book called Still Here <laughs> in opposition to Left Behind. And I said, I laughed and I said, wait a minute, Scott, that's a good idea. <laughs> I've been praying for years. What am I going to do with this material I've got? Uh, all these notes. And my studies on eschatology. What am I going to do? That was my answer to prayer. So you did the still so here series. The title of my series. So I have a series on biblical eschatology. It's called Still Here. And yeah. there's four books published. The first book is The Third Day Bible Code. The second book is Warrior from Heaven. That's about the second coming of Christ and everything after. Okay. Then along comes Moses predicted COVID-19. So that's controversial. It sounds uh, like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's about the food laws. Okay. Uh, primarily. And then the Trump book. My next book will be about Jesus' second coming. Oh, I've got a book uh, with the title, Late Great Plastic Empire. <laughs> As opposed to Late Great Planet Earth? <laughs> yeah, because Lindsay and I came from the same church. Bracket oh, church. wow. And he turned me on to biblical eschatology. It's incredible how many of these big names you know. In person, you've met these folks. You know, Ed Clowney was extremely influential for Tim Keller. R.C. Sproul influenced millions of people yeah. uh, with his radio show. Uh, James Dunn is literally a legend in yeah. Christology, especially Unitarian Christology, uh, which I, I don't think that he necessarily was a Unitarian, but his research was very influential. Um, yeah. it's, it's really incredible all the the shoulders you've rubbed over the years, you know, and you God has kind of given you access to certain uh, certain people over time. And, uh, you know, it seems like you've you've been able to and your friendship with Scott as well. You've been able to make some inroads there. Um, you know, I, I, I have a friend who is a Trinitarian pastor. And, um, you know, you see this from time to time uh, on my podcast where a Trinitarian will will be interested in some other subject that I'm covering on the podcast. And, you know, they'll join and listen for a little while. And then they'll find out I'm a non-Trinitarian. And they're like, what's going on here? And uh, But then sometimes they stay and they're like, you know what, I don't agree with you on this one thing, but, you know, I still enjoy your work. Um, what would you say to, to folks in that category, you know, that uh, I, I think, I guess, in the previous times, there were not as many people like that. But I think over time, there's coming more and more where they're like, you know what, I don't agree with you, but I can call you a Christian brother. Yeah. You know, what what would you say to somebody in that category? Well, I, I just believe it, it's an important issue. Uh, and so I wouldn't just lay it aside and say, ah, that's yeah. too much of an intellectual exercise. Uh, if I do, if, you know, if I was to change on this, uh, it's going to negatively affect me socially, uh, ecclesiastically, meaning church, friends and all that. Uh, if you're going to be serious about following Jesus, 
uh, those things should not stop you from trying to discover the truth of God. Very good. I, I think some people would hear what you said before about it not being a salvation issue and say, oh, well, then it doesn't matter. And that's not what you're saying. You're saying it does matter. It's not a salvation issue, but it is important. Well, hey, which would you rather believe? The real Jesus or a caricature of him? I believe church fathers made a mistake. They made a mistake. The Bible does not say Jesus is God. That's really important. Uh, when you go out and proclaim the Christian gospel to the world, that makes a difference. Whether yeah. you're saying Jesus is God or no, that makes a difference. There are people out there who say, no, nah, man can't be God. And so they turn you off to your message. So you're losing all those people. I'm not saying it's a whole lot, but people who are thinkers, there's a lot of them who are going to say that. And so it's just, it's so important to know who Jesus really is. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, if you're going to give your life to this man, this Jew, who says he's of God, and he's brought the message of God, and then he went to the cross for it, and you're going to give your life to him, it's important to know who he really is. Absolutely, yeah. So, Very yeah, don't go so far as to say it's a salvation image, uh, issue. That's right. But I, I do think it's extremely important to get it right. All right. Anything else you'd like to cover? But, uh, I think that's we... it, Sean. I really okay. appreciate your work. <laughs> I, uh, You have the restitution. I love that. Yeah. Uh, people can go online there and, and read all the comments, read what you're saying and others are saying. Um, and so I encourage people to do that. Very good. Well, thanks for joining me today on the show. Uh, I love it.